Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the effect of sympathetic stimulation on the heart. Okay, so, so far what we've seen is that when we release noradrenaline onto the surface of a heart cell, what's going to happen is that it's going to lead to the production of cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP is going to activate protein kinases, enzymes. And we've now discussed the two different types of protein kinase enzyme. So I now want to give you the examples of where these different types of protein kinase are involved and how they're going to uh, phosphorylate different targets, basically. So we're going to start off with the way in which you get uh, phosphorylation of uh, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, which, remember, is in the membrane of the cardiomyocytes and is responsible for allowing calcium to move in from the extracellular space to cause uh, the calcium sparklet, which then induces the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the so-called calcium spark. So it's very, very important. And we'd quite like to increase the size of the calcium sparklet so that we can hopefully increase the number of type 2 ryanidine receptors we activate and therefore increase the release of calcium from the SR. So we'd quite like to increase the conductance of these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, and we're going to do that by uh, phosphorylating them with protein kinase A. And basically, the protein kinase A that's going to target L-type voltage-gated calcium channels is going to be a type 2 protein kinase A. So what I want to do now is discuss the complex that it's involved in. So, basically, if this is the plasma membrane here, Okay, what you will have is you'll have your beta-1 adrenergic receptor here. Okay, you'll then have your heterotrimet G protein positioned very close by. Okay, so here's your heterotrimet G protein, which will be activated when the noradrenaline binds to the beta-1 receptor. So let me colour these things in so that it doesn't look too intimidating a drawing. Okay, so here's our beta-1 adrenergic receptor, so this is the beta-1, okay, and when noradrenaline comes in here and binds to that beta-1 receptor, it's going to activate the heterotrimeric G protein, specifically the alpha-S subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein, which is in pink here, okay, so this is the alpha-S here. Okay, nearby then, and this will all be in a great big complex basically, things will be joining them together. You'll then have your adenylalcyclase 5 slash 6 enzyme. So it can be either or. It, well, it's one or the other, basically. Okay, so here's our adenylalcyclase 6. So this is adenylalcyclase, sorry, adenylalcyclase 5 slash 6. And basically, the, the, re, the thing I'm trying to get across here is that they are not just floating around in the membrane um, unorganized basically. They are instead all bound together in a massive great complex, so that when this one's activated, it'll activate this one, and then this thing sitting right next to it, it'll be activated, and then actually the protein kinase A is also going to be part of this complex. So, we'll continue our story after I've coloured in the adenylalcyclase 5 slash 6 enzyme, so it's going to be in blue here. Okay, and now we need to introduce a new player that we haven't seen before, which is a protein which is going to connect the adenylalcyclase 5 slash 6 enzyme to the protein kinase A uh, of the type 2, of the second type. Okay, and this is what's known as an ACAP protein, okay? And ACAP stands for A kinase, so uh, meaning protein kinase A, so A kinase, anchoring protein, okay? So it's a protein which anchors protein kinase A, and it specifically anchors protein kinase A of the second type, because only protein kinase A of the second type has the correct regulatory subunit that it will be able to bind to this ACAP. Now the specific ACAP uh, because there are many different ACAPs. The specific ACAP, which binds to adenylalcyclase 5 slash 6 and also binds to L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, as we're going to see, is an ACAP protein known as ACAP79. So I'll draw it 
in this bizarre shape which doesn't have any um, reflectance on what it actually looks like. This is a cartoon, don't read too much into it. These structures do have some sort of, um, they do sort of, you know, bear some resemblance to what the protein actually looks like. As far as the transmembrane spanning uh, regions are concerned, that is the way it's structured, but this is just a blob, basically. <laughs> it's not meant to represent what it actually looks like. Okay, so this is our A cap, again drawn in this bright purple colour here. And specifically, the A cap involved in this is an A cap known as A cap 79. Okay, so A cap, and then we've run out of space, how awful? 79. Right, I'm going to label it up here as well. So this is A cap, A kinase anchoring protein 79. Okay, right. And this protein will also be attached to a type 2 protein kinase A. So here is our type 2 protein kinase A. So we have the second regulatory subunit, the R2 subunit, which can bind to A caps. The R1 of pro type 1 protein kinase A can't bind to these A caps. So this was the protein I was talking about before uh, when I said that the type 2 protein kinase A gets anchored at the membrane. It's by these A kinase anchoring proteins. So here is our type 2 protein kinase A. So this is the R2 subunit here the second regulatory subunit, which makes this protein kinase A the type 2 protein kinase A. And here are the catalytic subunits, which are exactly the same as the catalytic subunits in the protein kinase A type 1. Okay, so we'll highlight the R2 subunits in this turquoise colour here. Okay, like so. And then we'll highlight the catalytic domains or the catalytic subunits, sorry, I do apologise for that. Uh, the catalytic subunits will highlight in this light green colour here. Okay, right. And the final thing that's in this great big complex is also the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So we'll draw the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel here. So this is basically bound to the A-cap as well. Uh, it's difficult to show it. I suppose I could do some sort of extension like that to show that it's bound. So here's a little bit of a sticky out process from the ACAP79 in order to show that it's binding to this um, L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, which we'll have in orange here. Okay, right. So, basically, what's now going to happen is that when the beta adrenergic receptor is stimulated, the beta 1 adrenergic receptor, it's going to activate the heterotrimeric G protein, which is going to activate our adenylyl cyclase 5 slash 6, which is then going to spit cyclic AMP onto our type 2 protein kinase A here. Uh, the cyclic AMP will bind in the four uh, binding sites of this regulatory uh, of these R2 subunits, okay, and they'll release the catalytic subunits, which will then be right next to this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, and basically what will happen is uh, these catalytic subunits will phosphorylate the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, increasing its conductance so that when it opens, it will allow more calcium to uh, move in and also so that it will be more easily activated basically so a higher percentage of them will be activated at any one time okay so that's how we increase the size of the calcium sparklets in response to uh, beta 1 stimulation by for instance noradrenaline would be the endogenous agonist Okay, right. So that's one example of how we have a complex uh, of proteins anchoring the type 2 protein kinase A nearby its target. In the next video, we'll see another example of a complex like this, uh, which is going to lead to the phosphorylation of the uh, type 2 ryanodine receptors.